Volume Two, Chapter Three of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Three. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Omar Khayyam. What thou doest, do quickly, has been advice which, in its melancholy sarcasm, has been followed for eighteen hundred years, when any special evil has been afoot in the dark. And yet surely the words apply still more urgently when the doing that is premeditated is good. What thou doest, do quickly. For even while we speak, those to whom we feel tenderly grow old and grey, and slip beyond the reach of human comfort, even while we dream of love, those whom we love are parted from us in an early hour when we think not, without so much as a rose to take with them, out of the garden of roses that were planted and fostered for them alone. And even while we tardily forgive our friends, lo, the page is turned, and we see that there was no injury, as now there is no compensation for our lack of trust. Colonel Tempest acted with promptitude, but though he was as expeditious as he knew how to be, that was not saying much. His continual dread was that others might be beforehand with him. He had at this time a dream that recurred, or seemed to recur, over and over again, that he was running blindly at night, and that unknown adversaries were coming swiftly up behind him, were breathing close, and passing him in the darkness unseen but felt. It haunted him in the daytime like a reality. Superstition would not be superstition if it were amenable to reason. Punishment hung over him like a sword in mid-air, might fall at any moment. What form of punishment it would be hard to say, something evil to himself. If he struck down another, might not the Almighty strike him down? It seemed to him that God's hand was raised. Sin no more. Wipe it out, obliterate it, expiate it, quick, quick! he set to work in feverish haste to find out Larkin. But although he had a certain knowledge of how to approach gentlemen of Swain's class, he could not at first unearth Larkin. The habitation of the wren is not more secluded than that of some of our fellow creatures. Colonel Tempest went very quietly to work. He never went near the address given him. He wrote anonymous letters repeatedly, suggesting a personal interview which would be found greatly to Mr. Larkin's advantage. Mr. Larkin, however, appeared to take a different view of his own advantage. It was in vain that Colonel Tempest said he should be walking on the Thames embankment the following evening, and we found at a given point at a certain hour. No one found him there, or at any of the other places he mentioned. He took a great deal of unnecessary exercise, or what appeared at the, to be at the time. Still he persisted. While the quarry remained in London, the hunter would probably remain there also. John had not gone yet. Colonel Tempest went on every few days making appointments for meeting, and keeping them rigorously himself. A fortnight passed. Larkin made no sign. At last Colonel Tempest heard that John was leaving town. He went to see him, and came away heavy at heart. John was out and the servant informed them that Mr. Tempest was going to Overley the following morning. Colonel Tempest had a presentiment that a stone would be dropped between the points of the Great Northern. The train would come to grief, somehow. If it all happened in a moment, there would be one fierce thrust in the dark which he should not be able to parry. And if John got safe to Overley, he would be followed there. The shooting season was coming on, and someone would loathe for him, and there would be an accident. Colonel Tempest went back to his rooms in Brook Street and stared at the carpet. He did not know how long it was before he caught sight of a batch of letters on the table. He looked carelessly at them. The uppermost was from his tailor. The address of the next was written in printed letters. He knew in an instant that it was from Larkin, without the further confirmation of the heavy seal with its shilling impression. His hand shook so much that he opened it with difficulty. The sheet contained a somewhat guarded communication, also written in laboriously printed capitals. Yours of the fourteenth to hand. All right. Place and time, you say. 
L. The writer had been so very desirous to avoid publicity that he had even taken the trouble to tear off the left inner side of the envelope on which the maker's name is printed. That significant precaution gave Colonel Tempest a sickening qualm. It suggested networks of other precautions in the background, snares which he might not perceive till too late, subtleties for which he was no match. He began to feel that it was physically impossible for him to meet this man, that he must get out of the interview at any cost. The maddening sense of being lured into a trap came upon him, and he flung in the opposite direction. But the facts came and looked him in the face. He seldom allowed them to do so, but they did it now in spite of him. Eyes that have been once avoided are ever after difficult to meet. Nevertheless he had to meet them. The cold, inexorable eyes of facts come up to the surface of his mind to have justice done them, grimy but redoubtable, like miners on strike. Cost what it might, he saw that he must capitulate, that he must take this, his one, his last chance, or, hateful alternative, take instead the consequences of neglecting it. He went over the old, well-worn ground once again. Detection was impossible. That nightmare of a murder, and of a voice that cried aloud while all the world stood still to hear, Thou art the man, was only a nightmare after all and this was the best way, the only way, to get rid of it. He tried to recall the time and place of meeting, but it was gone from him. There had been so many. No, he had scrawled it down on the fly-leaf of his pocket-book. Six o'clock. It was nearly five now. He had the money in readiness for the last fortnight. He had drawn one thousand of the ten which John had placed to his credit. He got out the ten crisp hundred-pound notes, and put them carefully into his breast-pocket. Then— he sat down and waited. When the half-hour chimed, he went out. There is a straight and quiet path behind Kensington Palace, which the lovers and nursery-maids of Kensington Gardens frequent but little. A line of low-growing knotted trees separates it from the broad walk at a little distance. A hedge and fence on the other side divides the gardens from a strip of meadow not yet covered by buildings. The public esteem this particular walk but lightly. Invalids in bath-chairs toil down it sometimes. Nurses with grown-up children, who are children still, go there occasionally, where the uncouth gambles and vacant bearded laugh of forty-five will not attract attention. But as a rule it is deserted. Colonel Tempest had it almost to himself for the first ten minutes except for a covey of little boys who fought and clambered and jumped on some stacked timber at one end. He had not chosen the place without forethought. It would be presumed that he would have a large sum of money with him, and he had taken care on each occasion to select a rendezvous where foul play would not be possible. He was within reach of numbers of persons merely by raising his voice. An old man on the arm of a young one passed him slowly, absorbed in earnest conversation. A girl in mourning sat down on one of the benches. There was privacy enough for business, and not too much for safety. Colonel Tempest paced up and down, giving each face that passed a furtive glance. He did not know what to expect. The three-quarters struck. The girl got up and turned away. A stout, shabby-looking man, whose approach Colonel Tempest had not noticed, was sitting on one of the benches under a gnarled yew staring vacantly in front of him. The old man and the young one were coming down the walk again. A check suit with six depressed amber-eyed dachshunds in a leash passed among the trees. A few more turns. The clock began to strike six. Colonel Tempest's pulse quickened. As he turned once more at the end of the walk, he could see that the hunched-up figure with the hat over the eyes was still sitting under the yew at the further end walked slowly towards it. How should they recognise each other? Who would speak first? A quietly dressed man, walking rapidly in the opposite direction, touched his hat respectfully as he passed him. Colonel Tempest recognised John's valet, and slackened his pace, for he was approaching the bench under the yew-tree, and he did not care to be addressed while anyone was within earshot. He was opposite now, and he looked hard at the occupant. The latter stared vacantly, if not sleepily, back at him, and made no sign. "'He's shamming,' 
said Colonel Tempest to himself, or else he is not sure of me. And he took yet another turn. The man had moved a little when he came towards him. He was leaning back in the corner of the bench, with his head on his chest, and his legs stretched out. An elderly lady, with curls and an umbrella clutched like a defensive weapon, was passing him with evident distrust, calling to her side a fleecy little toy dog, which seemed to have left its stand and wheels at home, and to be rather at a loss without them. Colonel Tempest looked hard a second time at the figure on the bench, when he came opposite him, and then stopped short. The man was sleeping the sleep of the just, or, to speak more correctly, of the just inebriated. His underlip was thrust out, he breathed stertorously. If it was a sham, it was very well done. Colonel Tempest stood a moment in perplexity, looking fixedly at him. Should he wake him? Was he perhaps waiting to be waked? Was he really asleep? He half put out his hand. "'I think, sir,' said a respectful voice behind him, "'begging your pardon, sir, the party is very intoxicated. Sometimes it woke suddenly they're vicious.' Colonel Tempest wheeled round. It was Marshal, John's valet, who had spoken to him, and who was now regarding the slumbering rough with the resigned melancholy of an undertaker. The court was struck. "'Sorry to have kept you waiting, sir,' said Marshall, after a pause, in which Colonel Tempest wondered why he did not go. And then at last Colonel Tempest understood. He put his hand feebly to his head. "'Oh, my God!' he said below his breath, and was silent. Marshall cleared his throat. There are situations in which, as Johnson has observed respecting the routine of married life, little can be said, but much must be done. The slumbering backslider slid a little further back in his seat, and gurgled something very low down about jolly good fellows, until his voice suddenly going upstairs in the middle, he added in a high quaver, "'Daylight does appear!' The musical outburst recalled Colonel Tempest somewhat to himself. He turned his eyes carefully away from Marshall, after that first long look of mutual understanding. The man's apparent respectability, his smooth-shaved face and quiet dress, from his well-brushed hat and black silk cravat to the dark dog-skin glove that held his irreproachable umbrella, set Colonel Tempest's teeth on edge. He had not known what to expect, but this! In a flash of memory he recalled the several occasions on which he had seen Marshall in attendance on John, his attentive manner, and noiseless tread. Once, before John could move, he had seen Marshall lift him carefully into a more upright position. The remembrance of that helpless figure in Marshall's arms came back to him with a shudder that could not be repressed. Marshall, whose expressionless face had undergone no change whatever, cleared his throat again and looked at his watch. Uh, "'Begging your pardon, sir,' he said. "'It's uh, nearly half-past six, and Mr. Tempest dines early to-night.' "'Did you receive my other letters?' said Colonel Tempest, pulling himself together, and beginning to walk slowly down the path. Uh, "'Yes, sir. I'm sorry to have put you to the inconvenience of going to so many places, especially as I saw for myself how regularly you turned up at them. But I wanted to make sure you were in earnest before I showed. My character is my livelihood, sir. There was a time when I was in trouble and got into Mr. Johnson's hands. But before that I had been in service in high families, very high, sir. Mr. Tempest took me on the recommendation of the Earl of Carmion. I was with him too here. "'Mr. Johnson,' said Colonel Tempest, stopping short and turning a shade whiter than he had been before. "'By God, I didn't know anything about a Mr. Johnson. What do you mean?' The two men eyed each other as if each suspected treachery. "'Did you write this?' said Marshall, producing Colonel Tempest's last letter. "'Yes.' "'Oh, then it's all right,' said Marshall, who had forgotten the sir. "'He had a sight of names.' Johnson he was when he found I took up your your bet. But I wrote to him, I remember, at one place as Crosby. Colonel Tempest recalled the curate's mention of Swain under the name of Crosby. Swain, or Crosby, or Johnson, it's all one, he said hastily. I want a certain bit of paper you have in your position, and I have ten Bank of England notes of a hundred each in my pocket now to give you an exchange. I suppose we understand each other. Have you got it on you? Yes. Produce it. Show up the notes, then, 
unnoticed by either, the manner of both as between gentleman and servant had merged into that of perfect equality. Love is not the only leveller of disparities of rank and position. They were walking together side by side, there was not a soul in sight. Each cautiously showed what he had brought. The dirty half-sheet of common note-paper with Colonel Tempest's signature seemed hardly worth the crisp notes, each one of which Colonel Tempest turned slowly over. Ten, said Marshall. All right. Stop, said Colonel Tempest hoarsely, the date on the ragged sheet he had just seen suggesting a new idea. You're too young, you're not five and thirty. By God, it's nearly sixteen years ago. You weren't in it, you couldn't have been in it. How did you come by that? Whom did you have it from? From one who'll tell no tales, returned Marshall. He'd be sick of it. He had tried twice, and he was near his end, and I took it off him just before he died. Did he die? said Colonel Tempest. I'm not so sure of that. I am, said the man. I never had nothing to do with the business. How long have you been with Mr. Tempest? A matter of three months. He engaged me when he came back from Russia in the spring. He will leave at once. That, of course, is understood. Uh, yes, I will give warning to-night if— uh, and the man glanced at the packet in Colonel Tempest's hand. Without another word, they exchanged papers. Colonel Tempest did not tear the document that had cost him so much into a thousand pieces. He looked at it, recognised that it was genuine, put it in his pocket, and buttoned his coat over it. Then he got out a notebook and pencil. And now, he said, the others. How am I going to get at them? The man stared. The others? he repeated. What others? You were one, said Colonel Tempest. Now about the rest. I mean to pay them all off. There were ten in it. Where are the nine? Marshall stood stock still, as if he were realising something unperceived till now. Then he shook his fist. Ned Johnson lied to me. I might have known. He took me in from first to last. I never thought that I was the, the only one. After all I've spent and the work I've been put to, when I might just as well have let one of the others risk it. He never acted square, damn him. Colonel Tempest looked at him horror-struck. The man's anger was genuine. Do you mean to say you don't know? He said in a harsh whisper, all that was left of his voice. Swain? Johnson? Said you did. On his deathbed he said so. No, retorted the man, his expressionless face having some meaning in it at last. Do you suppose if I'd known, I'd have— That's been the line he has gone on from the first, you may depend on it. He has let each one think he was alone at the job to bring it round quicker. Double-tongued, double-dealing devil! Each of them others is working for himself now, single-handed. I wonder they haven't brought it off before. Why, that fire! We was both nearly done for that night. I slept just above him, and it was precious near. If you not run up himself and woke me at that fire— Marshall stopped short. His mouth fell ajar. His mind was gradually putting two and two together. There was no horror in his face, only a malignant sense of having been duped. "'By God!' he said fiercely. "'I see it all!' A cold hand seemed to be laid on Colonel Tempest's heart, to press closer and closer. The sweat burst from his brow. Swain had been an economiser of truth to the last. He had deliberately lied, even on his deathbed, in order to thrust away the distasteful subject to which Colonel Tempest had so pertinaciously nailed him. The two men stood staring at each other. A governess and three little girls, evidently out for a stroll after tea, were coming towards them. The sight of the four advancing figures seemed to shake the two men back in a moment, with a gasp, to their former relations. Marshall drew himself up and touched his hat. "'Ought to be going, sir,' he said, almost in his usual ordered tones. "'Mr. Tempest dines early to-night.' Colonel Tempest nodded. He had forgotten for the moment how to speak. "'And it's all right, sir, about—about about me?' rather anxiously. Colonel Tempest perceived that Marshall had not realised the possible hold he might obtain over him by the mere fact of his knowledge of this last revelation. He had been obtuse before. He was obtuse now. "'As long as you are silent and leave at once,' said Colonel Tempest, commanding his tongue to articulate, "'I will be silent too. Not a moment longer.' 
Marshal touched his hat again, and went. Colonel Tempest walked unsteadily to a bench under a twisted yew, a little way from the path, and sat down heavily upon it. How cold it was, how bitterly cold! He shivered and drew his hand across his damp forehead. The tinkling of voices reached him at intervals. Foolish birds were making choruses of small jokes in the branches above his head. Someone laughed at a little distance. He alone was wretched beyond endurance. Perhaps he did not know what endurance meant. Panic shook him like a leaf. And there was no refuge. He did not know how to live. Dared he die? Die and struggle up the other side only to find an angry judge waiting on the brink to strike him down to hell, even while he put up supplicating hands? But his hands were red with John's blood, so that even his prayers convicted him of sin, were turned into sin. A feeling as near despair as his nature could approach to overwhelmed him. One of the most fatal results of evil is that in the same measure that it exists in ourselves, we imply it in others, and not less in God himself. Poor Colonel Tempest saw in his creator only an omniscient detective, an avenger, an executioner who had mocked at his endeavours to propitiate him, to escape out of his hand, who held him as in a pillory, and will presently break him upon the wheel. Superstition has its uses, but, like most imitations, it does not wear well, not much better, perhaps, than the brown paper boots in which the English soldier goes forth to war. A cheap faith is an expensive experience. I believe Colonel Tempest suffered horribly as he sat alone under that yew tree, underwent all the throes which self-centred people do undergo, who, in saving their life, see slipping through their fingers, who, in clutching at their own interest and pleasure, find themselves sliding into a gulf, who, in sacrificing the happiness and welfare of those that love them to their whim, their caprice, their shifting temper of the moment, find themselves at last alone, unloved. Are there many sorrows like this sorrow? There is perhaps only one worse. Namely, to realise what onlookers have seen from the first, what has brought it about. This is hard. But Colonel Tempest was spared this pain. Those for whom others can feel least compassion are, as a rule, fortunately able to bestow most upon themselves. Colonel Tempest belonged to the self-pitying class, and with him, to suffer was to begin at once to be sorry for himself. The tears ran slowly down his cheeks, and his lip quivered. But there is nothing quite so heartbreaking as the tears of middle age for itself. He saw himself sitting there so lonely, so miserable, without a creature in the world to turn to for comfort, entrapped into evil as all are at times, for he was but human. He never set up to be better than his fellows but to have striven so hard against evil, to have tried, as not many would have done, to repair what had been wrong, and the greatest wrong had not been with him, and yet to have been repulsed by God himself. Everybody had turned against him, and now God had turned against him too. His last hope was gone. He should never find those other men, never buy back those other bets. John would be killed sooner or later, and he himself would suffer. That was the refrain, the keynote to which he always returned. He should suffer. Natures like Colonel Tempest go through the same paroxysms of blind, despairing grief as do those of children. They see only the present. The maturer mind is sustained in its deeper anguish by the power of looking beyond its pain. It has bought, perhaps dear, the chill experience that all things pass, that sorrow endures but for a night, even as the joy that comes in the morning endures but for a morning. But as a child weeps and is disconsolate, and dries its eyes and forgets, so Colonel Tempest would presently forget again, for a time. Indeed, he soon took the best means within his reach of doing so. He felt that he was too wretched to remain in England. It was therefore imperative that he should go abroad, Persons of his temperament have a delightful confidence in the benign influences of the continent. He wrote to John, returning him £8,500 of the £10,000, saying that the object for which it had been given had become so altered 
as to prevent the application of the money. He did not mention that he had found a use for one thousand, and that pressing personal expenses had obliged him to retain another five hundred, but he was vaguely conscious of doing an honourable action in returning the remainder. John wrote back at once, saying that he had given him the money, and that as his uncle did not wish to keep it, he should invest it in his name and settle it on his daughter, while the interest at four per cent would be paid to Colonel Tempest during his lifetime. Well, said Colonel Tempest to himself after reading this letter, beggars can't be choosers, but if I had been in John's place, I hope I should not have shown such a grudging spirit. Eight thousand five hundred. Out of all his wealth he might have made it ten thousand for my poor, penniless girl. No wonder he does not wish her to know about it. And, having a little ready money about him, Colonel Tempest took his penniless girl, much to her surprise, a lapis lazuli necklace when he went to say good-bye to her. On the last evening before he left England he got out the paper Marshall had given him, and, having locked the door, spread it on the table before him. He had done this secretly many times a day since he had obtained possession of it. There it was, unmistakable in black and grime that had once been white. The one thing of all others in this world that Colonel Tempest loathed was to be obliged to face anything. Like Pierre Gint, he went round, or, if like Balaam he came to a narrow place where there was no turning-room, he struck furiously at the nearest sentient body. But a widower has no beast of burden at hand to strike, and there was no power of going round, no power of backing either, from before that sheet of crumpled paper. When he first looked at it he had a kind of recollection that was no recollection of having seen it before. The words were as distinct as a death warrant. Perhaps they were one. Colonel Tempest read them over once again. I, Edward Tempest, lay one thousand pounds to one sovereign that I do never inherit the property of Overley in Yorkshire. There was his own undeniable scrawling signature beneath Swain's crab-like characters. There below his own was the signature of that obscure speculator, since dead, who had taken up the bet. If anything is forced upon the notice, which yet it is distasteful to contemplate, the only remedy for avoiding present discomfort is to close the eyes. Colonel Tempest struck a match, lit the paper, and dropped it into the black July grate. It would not burn at first, but after a moment it flared up and turned over. He watched it writhe under the little chuckling flame. The word overly came out distinctly for a second, and then the flame went out, leaving a charred, curled nothing behind. One solitary spark flew swiftly up like a little soul released from an evil body. Colonel Tempest rubbed the ashes with his foot, and once again closed his eyes. End of Volume 2, Chapter 3《Volume Two, Chapter Four of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Four. I give thee sixpence. I will see thee damned first. Canning. Some one rejoiced exceedingly when, in those burning August days, John came back to Overley. Mitty loved him. She was the only woman who as yet had shown him any love at all and his nature was not an unthankful one. Mitty was bound up with all the little meagre happiness of his childhood. She had given him his only glimpse of woman's tenderness. There had never been a time when he had not read aloud to Mitty during the holidays, when he had forgotten to write to her periodically from school. When she had been discharged with the other servants at his father's death, he had gone in person to one of his guardians to request that she might remain and had offered half his pocket-money annually for that purpose, and a sum down in the shape of a collection of foreign coins in a sock. Perhaps his guardian had a little boy of his own in Eton jackets who collected coins. At any rate, something was arranged. Mitty remained in the long, low nurseries in the attic gallery. She was waiting for him on the steps on that sultry August evening when he returned. John saw her white cap twinkling under the stone archway, as he drove along the straight, wide drive between the double rows of beeches 
which approached the castle by the northern side. Some houses have the soothing influence of the presence of a friend. Once established in the cool, familiar rooms and strong air of his native home, he regained his health by a succession of strides, which contrasted curiously with the stumbling ups and downs and constant relapses which in the earlier part of his recovery had puzzled his doctors. For the first few days, just to live was enough. John had no desire beyond sitting in the shadow of the castle with Mitty, and feeling the fresh, heather-scented air from the moors upon his face and hands. Then came the day when he went on Mr. Goodwin's arm down the grey lichened steps to the Italian garden, and took one turn among the stone-aged beds under the high south wall. Gradually, as the languor of weakness passed, he wandered further and further into the woods, and lay for hours under the trees among the ling and fern. The irritation of weakness had left him, the enforced inaction of slowly returning strength had not yet begun to chafe. His mind urged nothing on him, required no decisions of him, but like a dear companion instead of a taskmaster, rested, and let him rest. He watched for hours the sunlight on the bracken, listened for hours to the tiny dissensions and confabulations of little creatures that crept in and out. There had been days and nights in London when the lamp of life had burned exceeding low, when he had never thought to lie in his own dear woods again, to see the all swinging and chiding against the sky, to hear the cry of the water-hen to its mate from the reeded pools below. He had loved these things always, but to see them again after toiling up from the gates of death is to find them transfigured. The light that never was on sea or land gleams for a moment on wood and world, for eyes that have looked but now into the darkness of the grave. Almost it seems in such hours as if God had passed by that way, as if the forest had knowledge of him, as if the awed pines kept him ever in remembrance. Almost. Almost. Di was never absent from John's thoughts for long together. His dawning love for her had as yet no pain in it, it wandered still in glades of hyacinth and asphodel. Truly, love is bonny a little while while it is new. Its feet had not yet reached the stony desert places and the lands of fierce heat and fiercer frost, through which all human love which does not die in infancy must one day travel. The strain and stress were not yet. John was coming back one evening from a longer expedition than usual. The violet dusk had gathered over the gardens, the massive flank and towers of the castle were hardly visible against the sky. As he came near he saw a light in the arched windows of the chapel, and through the open lattice came the sound of the organ. Someone was playing within, and the knight listened from without. John stood and listened too. The organ, so long dumb, was speaking in an audible voice, was telling of many things that had lain long in its heart and that now at last trembled into speech. Some unknown touch was bringing all its pure, passionate soul to its lips. Its voice rose and fell, and the listening knight sighed in the ivy. John went noiselessly indoors by the postern, and up the short spiral staircase in the thickness of the wall, into the chapel, an arched Elizabethan chamber leading out of the dining-hall. He stopped short in the doorway. The light of a solitary candle at the further end gave shadows to the darkness. As by an artistic instinct it just touched the nearest of the pipes, and passing entirely over the prosaic footman, blowing in his shirt-sleeves, lit up every feature of the fair, exquisite face of the player. Beauty remains beauty, when all has been said and done to detract from it. Archie was very good to look upon. Even the footman who had been ruthlessly torn away from his supper to blow thought so. John thought so as he stood and looked at his cousin, who nodded to him and went on playing. The contrast between the two was rather a cruel one, though John was unconscious of it. It was Archie who mentally made the comparison whenever they were together. Ugliness would be no disadvantage, and beauty would have no power, if they did not appear to be the outward and visible signs of the inner and spiritual man. Archie was so fair-haired, he had such a perfect profile, such a clear complexion, and such tender, faithful eyes, 
that it was impossible to believe that the virtues which clear complexions and lovely eyes so plainly represent were not all packed with sardine-like regularity in his heart. His very hair looked good. It was parted so beautifully, and it had a little innocent wave on the temple which carried conviction with it, to the young of the opposite sex. It was not because he was so handsome that he was the object of a tender solicitude in many young girls' hearts, at least, so they told themselves repeatedly, but because there was so much good in him, because he was so misunderstood by elders, so interesting, so unlike other young men. In short, Archie was his father over again. Nature had been hard on John. Some ugly men look well, and their ugliness does not matter. John's was not of that type dear to fiction. His features were irregular and rough, his deep-set eyes did not redeem the rest of his face, nothing did. A certain gleam of nobility, shining dimly through its harsh setting, would make him better looking later in life, when expression gets the mastery over features. But it was not so yet. John looked hard and cold and forbidding, and though his face awoke a certain interest by its very force, the interest itself was without attraction. It must be inferred that John had hair as he was not bald, but no one had ever noticed it except his hair-cutter. It was short and dark. In fact, it was hair, and that was all. Mitty was the only other person who had any of it in a lozenge-box, but who shall say in what lockets and jewel-cases one of Archie's flaxen rings might not be treasured? Archie was a collector of hair himself, and there is a give and take in these things. He had a cigar-box full of locks of different colours, which were occasionally spread out before his more intimate friends, with little anecdotes respecting the acquisition of each. A vain man has no reticence, except on the subject of his rebuffs. Bets were freely exchanged on the respective chances of the donors of these samples of devotion, and their probable identity commented on. Three to one on the black, ten to one on the dyed amber, forty to one on the lank and sandy, it's an heiress. Archie would listen in silence, and smile his small saintly smile. Archie's smile suggested anthems and summer dawns and blancmange all blent in one. And then he would gather up the landmarks of his affections, and put them back into the cigar-box. They were called Tempest's Scalps in the regiment. Archie had sat for Sir Galahad to one of the principal painters of the day. He might have sat for something very spiritual and elevating now. What historic heroes and saints have played the organ? He would have done beautifully for any one of them, or Dixie might have worked him up into a pendant to his harmony, with an angel blowing instead of the footman. And, just at that critical moment when the organ was arriving at a final confession and swelling towards a dominant seventh, the footman let the wind out of her. There was a discord and a wheeze and a death-rattle. Archie took off his hands with a shudder and smiled a microscopic smile at the perspiring footman. Archie never, never, never swore, not even when he was alone and when he cut himself shaving. He differed from his father in that. He smiled instead. Sometimes his things went very wrong, the smile became a grin, but that was all. "'That'll do, thank you,' he said, rising. "'Well, John, how are you? Better? I did not wait dinner for you, I was too hungry, but I told them to keep the soup and things hot till you came in.' They had gone through the open double doors into the dining-room hall. At the further end a table was laid for one. "'When did you arrive?' asked John. "'By the seven ten, I, I walked up and found you were missing. "'It's distressing to see a man eat when one is not hungry oneself,' "'continued Archie plaintively as the servant brought in the hot things "'which he had been recently devastating. "'No, thanks, I won't sit opposite you and watch you satisfy your country appetite. "'You don't mind my smoking in here, I suppose. "'No woman kind to grumble as yet.' "'He lit his pipe, and began wandering slowly about the room.' which was lit with candles in silver sconces at intervals along the panelled walls. John wondered how much money he wanted, and ate his cutlets in silence. He had as few illusions about his fellow-creatures as the steward of a channel steamer, and it did not occur to him that Archie could have any reason but one for coming to Overley out of the shooting season. Archie was evidently pensive. 
It's a large sum, said John to himself. Presently he stopped short before the fireplace and contemplated the little silver figures standing in the niches of the high-carved mantel-shelf. They had always stood there in John's childhood, and when he had come back from Russia in the spring he had looked for them in the plate-room and had put them back himself. The quaint frilled courtier beside the quaint ruffed lady, and the little cavalier in long boots beside the abbess. The dresses were of Charles I's state, and there was a family legend to the effect that that victim of a progressive age had given them to his devoted adherent Amius Tempest the night before his execution. It was extremely improbable that he had done anything of the kind, but at any rate there they were, each in his little niche. Archie lifted one down and examined it curiously. "'Never saw that before,' he said, keeping his teeth on the pipe, which desecrated his profile. "'Everything was put away when I was not regularly living here,' said John. "'I dug out all the old things when I came home in the spring, and Mitty and I put them all back in their places.' "'Barfin had a sale the other day,' continued Archie, speaking through his teeth. "'He was let in for a lot of money by his training stables, and directly the old chap died he sold the library and half the pictures and a lot of stuff out of the house. I went to see them at Christie's, and a very mouldy-looking assortment they were, and they fetched a pile of money. Barford and I looked in when the sale of the books was on, and you should have seen the room full of Jews and the way they bid. One book, a regular old fossil, went for three hundred while we were there. It would have killed old Barford on the spot if he'd been there, so it was just as well he was dead already. And there were two silver figures, something like these, but not perfect. Barford said he had no use for them, and they fetched a hundred apiece. He says there's no place like home for raising a little money. Why, John, Gunningham can't hold a candle to Overly. There must be a mint of money in an old barrack stuffed full of gimcracks like this. Yes, but they belong to the house. Do they? Well, if I were in your place, I should say they belong to the owner. What's the use of having anything if you can't do what you like with it? If ever I wanted a hundred or two, I would trot out one of these little silver donnies in no time, if, if they were mine. John did not answer. He was wondering what would have happened to the dear old stately place if he had died a month ago, and if it had fallen into the hands of those two spendthrifts, Archie and his father. He could see them in possession whittling it away to nothing, throwing its substance from them with both hands. Easy-going, self-indulgent, weakly violent, unstable as water, he saw them both in one lightning-flash prophetic imagination, drinking in that very room, at that very table. The physical pain of certain thoughts is almost unbearable. He rose suddenly and went across to the deep bay window, on the stone sill of which Amyas Tempest and Tom Fairfax, his friend, who together had held overly against the roundheads, had cut their names. He looked out into the lattice darkness and longed fiercely, passionately, for a son. Archie's light laugh recalled him to himself with a sense of shame. It is irritating to be goaded into violent emotion by one who is feeling nothing. "'Benny for your thoughts,' said Sir Galahad. There was something commonplace about the young warrior's manner of expressing himself in daily life, which accorded ill with the refined beauty of his face. "'They would be dear at the price.' said John, still looking out. "'Care killed a cat,' said Archie. He had a stock of small sayings of that calibre. Sometimes they fitted the occasion, and sometimes not. There was a short silence. "'Quicksilver is lame,' said Archie. "'What have you been doing with her?' asked John, facing round. "'Oh, nothing in particular. I rode her in the Pier Point steeplechase last week, and she came down at the last fence and lost me fifty pounds.' I came in third, but I should have been first, to a dead certainty, if she had stood up. Send her down here at once. Oh, yes, and thanks awfully and all that sort of thing for lending her, don't you know? Very good of you. Though, of course, you could not use her yourself when you were laid up. I'm going back to town first thing tomorrow morning, and you've got a day's leave to run down here. Thought I ought to tell you about her. I'll send her off the day after tomorrow, if you like, but the truth is— A good deal of circumlocution that favourite attire of certain truths, was necessary before the simple fact could be arrived at, that Quicksilver had been used as security for the modest sum of four hundred and forty-five pounds, 
which had been absolutely incumbent on Archie to raise at a moment's notice. Heaven only knew what would not have been involved if he had not had reluctant recourse to this obvious means of averting dishonour. When Colonel Tempest and Archie began to talk about their honour, which was invariably mixed up with debts of a dubious nature, and an overdrawn banking account and an unpaid tailor, John always froze perceptibly. The Tempest honour was always having narrow escapes, according to them. It required constant support. "'I would not have done it if I could have helped it,' explained Archie in an easy attitude on the window-seat. "'Your mare, not mine. I knew that well enough. I felt that at the time. But I had to get the money somehow, and positively the poor old G was the only security I had to give.' Archie was not in the least ashamed. It was always John who was ashamed on these occasions. There was a long silence. Archie contemplated his nails. "'It's not the money I mind,' said John at last. "'You know that.' "'I know it isn't, old chap. It's my morals you're afraid of. You said so in the spring.' "'Well, I'm not going to hold forth on morals again, as it seems to have been of so little use. But look here, Archie. I've paid up a good many times, and I'm getting tired of it. I would rather build an infant school, or a home for cats, or something with a pretense of common sense, with the money in the future. It does you no manner of good. You only chuck it away. You are the worst for having it, and so am I for being such a fool as to give it to you. It's nonsense telling you suddenly that I won't go on paying, when I've led you to expect I always shall, because I always have. Of course you think, as I'm well off, that you can draw on me for ever and ever. "'Well, I'll pay up again this once. "'You promised me in April it should be the last time you'd run up bills. "'Now it is my turn to say this is the last time I'll throw money away in paying them.' "'Archie raised his eyebrows. "'How very close-fisted John was becoming. "'And as a boy at school, and afterwards at college, "'he'd been remarkably open-handed, "'even as a minor on a very moderate allowance. "'Archie did not understand it. "'I'll buy back my own horse,' continued John, trying to swallow down a sense of intense irritation. "'And if there is anything else, I suppose there's a new crop by this time, I'll settle them. You must start fair. And I'll go on allowing you three hundred a year, and when you want to marry I'll make a settlement on your wife, but, by God, I'll never pay another sixpence for your debts as long as I live.' Archie smiled faintly and stretched out his legs. John really cut up rough like this. He had an uneasy suspicion that the present promptly afforded assistance would hardly compensate for the opening vista of discomfort in the future. And John's tone jarred upon him. There was something fixed in it, and Archie's nebulous, easy-going temperament had an invincible repugnance to anything unpliable. He had as little power to move John as a mist has to move a mountain. It proved on many occasions how little amenable John was to persuasion, and each recurring occasion had filled him with momentary apprehension. He felt distinctly uncomfortable after the two had parted for the night, until a train of reasoning, the logic of which could not be questioned, soothed him into his usual trustful calm. John, he said to himself, had been out of temper. He had eaten something that had disagreed with him. That was why he had flown out. How frightfully cross he himself was when he had indigestion! And he, Archie, would never have grudged John a few pounds now and again if their positions had been reversed. Therefore it was not likely John would either. And John had always been fond of him. He had nursed him once at college through a tedious illness, unadorned on his side by Christian patience and fortitude. Of course John was fond of him. Everybody was fond of him. It had been an unlucky business about Quicksilver. No wonder John had been annoyed. He would have been annoyed himself in his place. But, how oh, all-embracing phrase, it would be all right. He was eased of money difficulties for the moment, and John was not such a bad fellow, after all. He would not really turn against him. He'd be sure to come round in the future, as he had always done with clock-like regularity in the past. Archie slept the sleep of the just, and went off in the best of spirits and the most expensive of light overcoats next morning with a cheque in his pocket. John went back into the dining-hall after his departure to finish his breakfast, but apparently he was not hungry, for he forgot all about it. He went and stood in the bay-window, as he had a habit of doing when in thought, and looked out. 
He did not see the purple pageant of the thunderstorm sweeping up across the moor and valley, and already vibrating among the crests of the trees in the vivid sunshine below the castle wall. He was thinking intently of those two men, his next of kin. Supposing he did not marry, supposing he died childless. Overly and the other vast Tempest properties were entailed, in default of himself and his children, on Colonel Tempest and his children. Colonel Tempest and Archie came next behind him. One slip, and they would be in possession. And John had almost slipped several times, had several times touched that narrow brink where two worlds meet. He had no fear of death, but nevertheless death had assumed larger proportions in his mind and in his calculations than is usual with the young and the strong, simply because he had seen him very near more than once and had ceased to ignore his reality. He might die. What then? John had an attachment which had the intensity of a passion and the unreasoning faithfulness of an instinct for certain carved and pictured rooms and lichened walls and forests and valleys and moors. He loved Overly. His affections had been planted under a north wall, and like some hardy, tenacious ivy they clung to that wall. Overly meant much to him, had always meant much, more than was in the least consistent with the rather advanced tenets which he, in common with most young men of ability, had held at various times. Theories have fortunately little to do with the affections. He could not bear to think of Overly passing out of his protecting love to the careless hands and selfish heedlessness of Colonel Tempest and Archie. There are persons for whom no income will suffice. John's nearest relations were of this time-honoured stamp. As has been well said, in the midst of life they are in debt. John saw Archie in imagination trotting out the silver johnnies, the miniatures, the pictures, the cameos, the old Tempest manuscripts, for which America made periodic bids, the older plates, all, all would go, would melt away from niche and wall and cabinet. Perhaps the books would go first of all, the library to which he in his turn was even now adding, as though who had gone before him had done. How they had loved the place, those who had gone before! How they must have fought for it in the early days of ravages by Borderer and Scott! How Amius, the cavalier, must have sworn to avenge those round-head cannonballs which crashed into his oak staircase and remained embedded in the stubborn wood to this day. Had any one of them loved it, John wondered, with a greater love than his? He turned from the blaze outside and looked back into the great shadowed room in the recesses of which a beautiful twilight ever lingered. The sunlight filtered richly but dimly through the time-worn splendour of its high windows of painted glass, touching here and there inlaid panel and carved wainscoting, and laying a faint mosaic of varied colour on the black polished floor. It was a room which long association had invested with a kind of halo in John's eyes, far removed from the appreciative or ignorant admiration of the stranger, who saw in it only an unique Elizabethan relic. Artist worshipped it whenever they got the chance, went wild over the Tudor fan vaulting of the ceiling with its long pendants and the quaint inlaid frets on the oak chimney-piece, talked learnedly of the panels above the wainscot, on which a series of genealogical trees were painted, representing each of the wapentakes into which Yorkshire was divided, having shields on them with armorial bearings of the gentry of the county entitled in Elizabeth's time to bear arms. Strangers took note of these things, and spelt out the rather apocryphal marriages of the tempests on the painted glass, or examined the date below the dial in the southern window with the name of the artist beneath it, which had blazoned the arms. Bernard Dimikoff, fake it, 1585. John knew every detail by heart, and saw them never as a man in love with a noble woman gradually ceases to see beauty or the absence of beauty in brow and lip and eyelid in adoration of the fate itself which meant so much to him. John's deep-set, steady eyes absently followed the slow travelling of the coloured sunshine across the room. Overly had coloured his life as its painted glass was colouring the sunshine. It was bound up with his whole existence. 
the Tempest motto graven on the pane beside him. Je le ferai durant ma vie, was graven on John's heart as indelibly. Mr. Tempest's dying words to him had never been forgotten. It is an honour to be a Tempest. You are the head of the family. Do your duty by it. The words were sunk into the deep places of his mind. What the child had promised, the man was resolved to keep. His responsibility and the great position in which God had placed him, his duty, not only as a man, but as a tempest, were the backbone of his religion. If those could be called religious who trust high instincts more than all the creeds. The family motto had become a part of his life. It was perhaps the only oath of allegiance which John had ever taken. He turned towards the window again, against which his dark head had been resting. The old thoughts and resolutions so inextricably intertwined with the fibre of pride of birth, the old hopes and aspirations, matured during three years' absence, temporarily dormant during these months of illness, returned upon him with the unerring swiftness of swallows to the eaves. He pressed his hand upon the pane. The thunderstorm wept hard against the glass. The sable tempest lion rampant on a field argent surmounted the scroll on which the motto was painted, legible still after three hundred years. John said the words aloud. Je le ferai durant ma vie. End of Volume 2, Chapter 4《ボリューム2》Chapter 5 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers.《ボリューム2》Chapter 5. There are many wonderful mixtures in the world which are all alike called love. George Eliot. These are troublesome times, Granny," said Di to Mrs. Courtney. Coming into her grandmother's room on a hot afternoon early in September, I can't get out. So you see, I am reduced to coming and sitting with you. And why are the times troublous? And why don't you go out of doors again? I've been to reconnoitre," said Di roughly, "and the coast is not clear. He's sitting on the stairs again as he did yesterday. Lord Hemsworth? No, of course not. When does he ever do such things? The infant." Oh dear! The infant was Lord Hemsworth's younger brother. And it is becoming so expensive, Granny. I keep on losing things. His complaint is complicated by kleptomania. He has got my two best evening handkerchiefs and my white fan already, and I can't find one of the gloves I wore at the picnic today. I dare not leave anything downstairs now. It is really very inconvenient. Poor boy," said Mrs. Courtney reflectively. "How old is he?" Oh, he is quite sixteen, I believe. What with this anxiety and the suspense as to how my primrose cotton will wash, which I am counting on to impress John with, I find life very wearing. Oh, Granny, we ought not to have come here at all, according to my ideas. But if we ever do again, I do beg and pray it may not be in the holidays. I wish I had not been so kind to him when we first arrived. I only wanted to show Lord Hemsworth he knew not to be so unnecessarily elated at our coming here. I wish I had not spent so many hours in the workshop with the boy and the white rats. The white rats did it, Granny. Interests in common are the really dangerous things, as you have often observed. Love me, love my rats. Poor boy," said Mrs. Courtney again. "Make it as easy as you can for him, Di. Don't wound his pride. We leave tomorrow, and the Verrells are coming today. That will create a diversion." I have never known Madeline allow any man or boy or creeping child attend to any one but herself if she is present. She will do her best to relieve you of him. How she will patronize you, Di, if she is anything like what she used to be. And in truth, when Madeline drove up to the house half an hour later, it was soon apparent that she was unaltered in essentials. Although she had been married several months, she was still the bride, the bride in every fold of her pretty travelling gown. In her demure dignity and enjoyment of the situation, it was her first visit to her cousin Lady Hemsworth since her marriage, 
and her eyes brightened with real pleasure when that lady mentioned that Di was in the house, whom she had not seen since her wedding day. She was conscious that she had some of her best gowns with her. "'I have always been so fond of Di,' she said to Di's would-be mother-in-law. "'She was one of my bridesmaids. You remember Di, Henry?' turning with a model gesture to her husband. Sir Henry sucked his tea noisily off his moustache, and said he remembered Miss Tempest. "'Now do tell me,' said Madeline, as she unfastened her hat in her room, whether she had insisted on Di's accompanying her. "'Is there a large party in the house? I always hate a large party to meet a bride.' "'There's really hardly any one,' said Di. "'I don't think you need be alarmed. The foresters left yesterday. There are Mr. Rivers, and a Captain Vivian, friend of Lord Hemsworth, and Lord Hemsworth himself, and a Mrs. Clifford, a widow. That's all. Oh, I've forgotten Mr. Lumley, the comic man. He's here. You may remember him. He always comes into a room either polkying or walking lame, and beats himself all over with a tambourine after dinner. How droll, said Madeline. Henry would like that. I must have him to stay with us some time. One is so glad of really amusing people, they make a party go off so much better. He does not black himself, does he? That nice Mr. Carnegie, who imitated the pig being killed, always did. I'm glad it's a small party, she continued, reverting to the previous topic, with a very moderate appearance of satisfaction. It is very thoughtful of Lady Hemsworth not to have a crowd to meet me. I dislike so being stared at when I am sent out first, so embarrassing every eye upon one, and I always flush up so. And now tell me, you dear thing, all about yourself. Fancy my not having seen you since my wedding. I don't know how we missed each other in London in June. I know I called twice, but Kensington is such miles away, and, and I have often longed to ask you how you thought the wedding went off. Perfectly. And you thought I looked well? Well for me, I mean. You looked particularly well. I thought it so unkind of Mother to cry. I would not let her come into my room when I was dressing, or indeed all that morning, for fear of her breaking down. But I had to go with her in the carriage, and she held my hand and cried all the way. Poor Mother always is so thoughtless. I did not cry myself, but I quite feared at one time I should flush. I was not flushed when I came in, was I? Not in the least. You looked your best. Several of the papers said so, said Madeline. Remarks on personal appearance are so vulgar, I think. The lovely bride, one paper called me. I dare say other girls don't mind that sort of thing being said, but it's just the kind of thing I dislike. And there was a drawing of me in my wedding gown in the ladies' pictorial. They simply would have it. I had to stand ready dressed the day before while they did it. And then my photograph was in one of the other papers. Did you see it? I don't think it is quite a nice idea, do you? So public. But they wrote so urgently, they said a photograph would oblige, and I had to send one in the end. I sometimes think, she continued reflectively, that I did not choose part of my trousseau altogether wisely, I think, with the summer before me, though I might have ventured on rather lighter colours. But, you see, I had to decide on everything in Lent when one's mind is turned to other things. I never wear any colour but violet in length. I never have since I was confirmed, and it puts one out for brighter colours. Things that look quite suitable after Easter seemed so gaudy before. Not sure what I should wear to-night. Wear that mauve and silver, said Di suddenly, and their eyes met. Madeleine looked away again instantly and broke into a little laugh. You dear thing, she said. I wish I had your memory for clothes. I remember now, though I had almost forgotten it, that the mauve brocade was brought in the morning you came to hear about my engagement. And do you remember, you quixotic old darling, how you wanted me to break it off? You were quite excited about it. I had not seen the diamonds then, interposed Di, with a faint blush at the remembrance of her own useless emotion. I am sure I never said anything about breaking it off after I had seen the two tiaras, or even hinted at throwing over that riviere. Madeleine looked puzzled. Whenever she did not quite understand what Di meant, she assumed the tone of gentle authority, which persons conscious of a reserved front seat, or possibly a leading part in the orchestra in the next world, naturally do assume in conversation with those whose future is less assured. "'I think marriage is too solemn a thing to make a joke of,' she said softly. "'And talking of marriage,' in a lowered tone, "'you would hardly believe, Di, the difference it makes, the way it widens one's influence. With men now, such a responsibility. I always think a married woman can help young men so much, 
I find it so much easier now than before I was married to give conversation a graver turn, even at a ball. I feel I know what people really are almost at once. I've had such earnest talks in ballrooms, Di, and at dinner parties, haven't you? No, said Di. I distrust a man who talks seriously over a pink ice the first time I meet him. If he is genuine, he is probably shallow, and the odds are he is not genuine, or he would not do it. I don't like religious flirtations, though I know they are the last new thing. You always take a low view, Di, said Madeleine regretfully. You always have, and I suppose you always will. It does not make me less fond of you, but I am often sorry when we talked together to notice how unrefined your ideas are. Your mind seems to run on flirtations. I see things very differently. You wanted me to throw over Henry, though I had given him my solemn promise. And it had been in the papers, interposed I. Don't forget that. But, she added, rising, I was wrong. I ought never to have said a word on the subject. And there is the dressing-bell, so I will leave you to prepare for victory. I warn you, Mrs. Clifford has one gown, a cresser, which is bad to beat, a lemon satin with an emerald velvet train, but she may not put it on. "'I never vie with others in dress,' said Madeline. "'I think it shows such a want of good taste. "'Did she wear it last night?' "'She did. "'Oh, then she won't wear it again.' "'But Di had departed. "'In change unchanged,' Di said to herself "'as she uncoiled her hair in her own room. "'I don't know what I expected of Madeline, "'yet I thought that somehow she would be different. "'But she isn't.' How is it that some people can do things that one would be ashamed oneself even to think of, and yet keep a good opinion of themselves afterwards, and feel superior to others? It is the feeling superior that I envy. It must make the world such an easy place to live in. People with a good opinion of for themselves have such an immense pull in being able to do the most peculiar things without a qualm. It must be very pleasant to truly and honestly consider oneself better than others and to believe that young men in white waistcoats hang upon one words. Yes, Madeline is not changed, and I shall wait for dinner if I moralise any longer. And I brushed back her yellow hair, which was obliging enough to arrange itself in the most interesting little waves and ripples of its own accord, without any trouble on her part. Di's hair was perhaps the thing of all others that womankind envied her most. It had the brightness of colouring and easy fascination of a child's, even the most wily and painstaking curling tongs could only produce on other less favoured heads a laboured imitation, which was seen to be an imitation. Madeline, as she sailed into the drawing-room in mauve and silver half an hour later, felt that her own rather colourless, elaborate fringe was not redeemed from mediocrity even by the diamonds mounting guard over it. The infant would willingly have bartered his immortal soul for one lock of Di's shining head, the hope that one small lock might be conceded to a last wild appeal, possibly upon his knees, sustained him through the evening, and he needed support. He had a rooted conviction that if only his mother had allowed him a new evening coat to this half, if he had only been more obviously in tails, Di might have smiled upon his devotion. He had been moderately fond of his elder brother till now, but Lord Hemsworth's cable-patterned shooting-stockings and fair, well-defined moustache were in themselves enough to rouse the hatred of one whose own upper lip had only reached the stage when it suggested nothing so much as a reminiscence of treacle, and whose only pair of heather stockings tarried long at the wash. But the infant had other grounds for nursing cane like sentiments towards his rival. Had not Lord Hemsworth repeatedly called him in the actual presence of the adored one by the nickname of Trousers? The infant's soubriquet among those of his contemporaries who valued him was Bags, but in ladies' society Lord Hemsworth was oft to soften the unrefinement of the name by modifying it to trousers. The infant writhed under the absolutely groundless suspicion that his brother already had, or might at any moment, confide the original to die. And even if he did not, even if the horrible appellation never did transpire, Lord Hemsworth's society term was almost as appropriate. The name of trousers was a death-blow to young romance. Sentiment withered in its presence. Years of devotion could not wipe out that odious word from her memory. He could see that it had set her against him. The mere sight of him was obviously painful to her sense of delicacy. She avoided him. She would marry Lord Hemsworth. 
In short, she would be the bride of another. Perhaps there was not within a radius of ten miles a more miserable creature than the infant, as he stood that evening before dinner, with folded arms, alone, aloof, by a pillar, looking daggers at any one who spoke to die. After dinner, things did not go much better. There were round games, in which he joined with Byronic gloom, in order to sit near Di. But Mr. Lumley, the licensed buffoon of the party, dropped into his chair when he left it for a moment to get Di a footstool, and, when Sterney requested to vacate it, only replied in fluent falsetto in the French tongue, Je voudrais, si vous coudrez, mais je ne canne pas. The infant controlled himself. He was outwardly calm, but there was murder in his eye. Lord Hemsworth, sitting opposite shuffling the card, looked up, and seeing the boy's white face, said good-naturedly, "'Come, Lumley, move up one. That is Trousers' place.' "'Oh, if Trousers wants it to press his suit,' said Mr. Lumley, vaulting into the next place, "'anything to oblige a fellow-sufferer.' And Sir Henry neighed suddenly, as his manner was when amused, and the infant, clenching his hands under the table, felt there was nothing left to live for in this world or the next save only revenge. As the last evening came to an end, even Lord Hemsworth's cheerful spirits flagged a little. He let the infant press forward to light Di's candle, and hardly touched her hand after the infant had released his spasmodic clutch upon it. His clear, honest eyes met hers with the wistful chien soumis look in them, which she had learned to dread. She knew well enough, though she would not have known it had she cared for him, that he had only remained silent during the last few days, because he saw it was no good to speak. He had enough perception not to strike at cold or lukewarm iron. "'Why can't I like him?' she said to herself as she sat alone in her own room. "'I would rather like him than any one else. I do like him better, much better than any one I know, and yet I don't care a bit about him. When he is not there, I always think I am going to care next time I see him. I wonder if I should mind if he fell in love with someone else. I dare say I should. I wish I could feel a little jealous. I tried to when he talked the whole afternoon to that lovely Lady Kitty. What a little treasure that girl is! I would marry her if I were a man. But it was no good. I knew he only did it because he was vexed with me. About I forget what. Well, tomorrow I shall be at Overley. I shall really see it at last with my own eyes. Why, it is after twelve o'clock, it is to-morrow already. Certainly it does not pay to have a date in one's mind. Ever since the end of July I have been waiting for September the third, and it has not hurried up in consequence. Anyhow, here it is, at last. End of Volume 2 Chapter 5《Volume Two, Chapter Six of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. — Volume Two, Chapter Six. It's a deep mystery the way the heart of man turns to one woman out of all the rest he's seen in the world, and makes it easier for him to work seven year for her, like Jacob did for Rachel, sooner than have any other woman for the asking. George Eliot. Life has its crystal days, its rare hours of a stainless beauty, and a joy so pure that we may dare to call in the flowers to rejoice with us, and the language of the birds ceases to be an unknown tongue. Our real life, as we look back, seems to have been lived in those days that memory holds so tenderly. But it is not so in reality. Fortitude, steadfastness, the makings of character— Come not of rainbow dawns and quiet evenings and the facile attainment of small desires. More frequently, they are the outcome of the sleepless nights that mould youth, of hopes not dead but run to seed, of the inadequate loves and friendships that embitter early life, and warn off the young soul from any more mistaking husks for bread. John had had many heavy days, and latterly many days and long-drawn nights when it had been uphill work to bear in silence, or bear at all, the lessons of that expensive teacher, physical pain. And now pain was past, and convalescence was past, 
and fate smiled and drew from out her a knotted medley of bright and sombre colours, one thread of pure untarnished gold for John, and worked it into the pattern of his life. Di was at Overley. Tall lilies had been ranged in the hall to welcome her on her arrival. The dogs had been introduced to her at tea-time. Lindo had allowed himself to be patted, and, after sniffing her dress attentively with the air of a connoisseur, had retired with dignity to his chair. Fritz, on the contrary, the amber-eyed Daxon, all tail-wagging and smiles and saliva, had made himself cheap at once, and had even turned her over on his back, inviting friction where he valued it most, before he had known Di five minutes. Di was really at Overley. Each morning John woke up incredulous that such a thing could be. Each morning listened for her light footfall on the stairs, and saw her come into the dining hall, an active, living presence through the cedar and ebony doors. There were a few other people in the house, the sort of chance collection which poor relations, arriving with great expectations and their best clothes, consider to be a party. There were his aunt, Miss Fane, and a young painter who was making studies for an Elizabethan etiera, and someone else, no more than one, two, or three others. John never clearly remembered afterwards who, or whether they were male or female. Perhaps they were friends of his aunt's. Anyhow, Mrs. Courtney, who had proposed herself at her own time, was apparently quite content. Di seemed content also, with the light-hearted joyous content of a life that has in it no regret, no story, no past. John often wondered in those days whether there had ever been a time when he had known what Di was like, what she looked like to other people. He tried to recall her as he had seen her first at the speaker's, but that photograph of memory of a tall, handsome girl was not the least like Di. Di had become Di to John, not like anything or anybody. Di in a shady hat sitting on the low wall of the bowling green, or Di riding with him through the forest, and up and away across the opal moors. Or better still, Di singing ballads in the pictured music-room in the evening, in her low, small voice, that was not considered good enough for general society, but which, in John's opinion, was good enough for heaven itself. The painter used to leave the others in the gallery and stroll in on these occasions. He was a gentle, elegant person, with the pensive, regretful air, often observable in an imaginative man who was married young. He made a little sketch of Di. He said it would not interfere, as John feared it might, with the prosecution of his larger work. Presently a wet morning came, and John took Di on an expedition to the dungeons with torches, and afterwards over the castle. He showed her the chapel, with its rose window and high altar, where the daughters of the house had been married, where her namesake, Diana, had been wed to Vernon of the Red Hand. He showed her the state-rooms with their tapestried walls and painted ceilings. Di extorted a plaintive music from the old spinet in the garret gallery where John's nurseries were. Mitty came out to listen, and then it was her turn. She invited Di into the nursery, which in these later days was resplendent with John's gifts, the pride of Mitty's heart, the envy of the elect ladies of the village. There were richly bound Bibles and church services and Russian leather writing-cases and inlaid tea-caddies and china stands and book-slides and satin-lined work-boxes bristling with cutlery and photograph frames and tea-sets. In fact, there was everything. There also John's prizes were kept, for Mitty had taken charge of them for him since the first holidays when he had rushed up to the nursery to dazzle her with the slim red volume which he had not thought of showing to his father to which, as time went on, many others were added, and even great volumes of Stuart Mill in calf and gold during the Oxford days. Mitty showed them to Di, showed her John's little high-chair by the fire, and his Noah's Ark. She gave Di full particulars of all his most unromantic illnesses, and produced photographs, taken at her own expense, of her lamb in every stage of bullet-headed childhood from an open-mouthed face and two clutching hands set in a lather of white lace, to a sturdy, frowning little boy in a black velvet suit leaning on a bat. "'There's the last,' said Mitty, pointing with pride to a large steel engraving of John in his heaviest expression, in a heavy gilt frame. 
That was done for the tenantry when Master John came of age. And Mitty, in spite of a desperate attempt on John's part to divert the conversation to other topics, went on to expatiate on that event until John fairly bolted, leaving her in delighted possession of a new and sympathetic listener. "'And all the steps was covered with red cloth,' continued Mitty to her visitor. "'And the crowd, Miss Dinah, you could have walked on their heads. And Mr. John came down into the hall, and Mr. Goodwin was with him, and he turns round to us, for we was all in the hall, drawn up in two rows, from Mrs. Alcock to the scullery-maid, and he says, "'Where is Mrs. Empson?' These were his very words, Miss Tempest, my dear, and I said, Here, sir, for I was along of Mrs. Alcock. And he says to Parker, Open both the doors, Parker. And then he says, quite quiet, as if it was just every day, I have not many relations here, for there was not a soul of his own family, miss, and he did not ask his mother's folk. But, he says, I have my two best friends here, and that is enough. Goodwin, he says, will you stand on my right, and you must stand on the other side, Mitty. "'It took me here, miss,' said Mitty, passing her hand over her waistband. "'And me and my cap and everything. I was all in a tremble. I felt I could not go. But he just took me by the hand, and there we was, miss, us three on the steps, and all the servants are gathered round behind, and a crowd such as never was in front. They trot down all the flower-beds to nothing. Hey, dear, when we come out, you should have heard em cheer, and when they see me by him, I heard him saying, "'Who's yon?' And they said, that's the old nurse has reared him from a babby. And they shouted till they was fit to crack, and called out, Three cheers for the old nurse. And Master John, he kept smiling at me, and I could do nothing but roar. And there was Mrs. Alcock. I could hear her crying behind, and Parker cried too, and he's not a man to show, isn't Parker, like we know him, miss, since he was born. And there was no one else there that did, only me and Parker and Mrs. Alcock, and Charles, as had been footman in the family, and came down special from London at Master John's expense. And such a speech as my precious lamb did make before them all, saying it was a day he should remember all his life. Those were his very words. Ah, it was beautiful. And all the presents as the deputations brought, one after another, and the cannon fired off fit to break all the glass in the windows. And in the evening a hawk's rose did howl in the courtyard, and a bonfire such as never was on Boat Hill. And when it got dark, you could see the bonfires burning at Carley and Gillingham and wet waste and right away to Kenston, all where his land is, bless him. Oh, dear me, Miss Temple, why was not some of you there? John, said Di half an hour later, as he was showing us some miniatures in the ebony cabinet in the picture gallery, which Cardinal Woolsey had given the tempest of his day, why were not some of us, Archie or father, at your coming of age? They were sitting in the deep window seat, with the miniatures spread out between them. There was no question about their coming, said John. Archie was going in for his examination for the army that week, and your father would not have come if he had been asked. I did invite our great uncle, General Hugh, but he was ill. He died soon afterwards. There was no one else to ask. You and your father and Archie and I are the only tempests there are. The miniatures were covered with dust. John's and I's pocket-handkerchiefs had an interest in common, which gradually obliterated all difference between them. "'Why would not father have come if you'd asked him?' said Di presently. "'You are friends, aren't you?' "'I suppose we are,' said John, "'if by friends one only means that we are not enemies. But there is nothing more than civility between us. You seem wonderfully well up in ancient family history, Di. Don't you know the story of the last generation?' No, said Di, I don't know anything for certain. Granny hardly ever mentions my mother even now. I know she's barely on speaking terms with father. I hardly ever see him. When she took me, it was on condition that father should have no claim on me. You did not know, then, said John slowly, that your mother was engaged to my father at the very time that she ran away with his own brother, Colonel Tempest? Di shook her head. She coloured painfully. John looked at her in silence, and then pulled out another drawer. "'She was only seventeen, he said at last, with a gentleness that was new to die. "'She was just old enough to wreck her own life, and my poor father's, 
but not old enough to be harshly judged. The heaviest blame was not with her. There is a miniature of her here. I suppose my father had it painted when she was engaged to him. I found it in the corner of his writing-table drawer, as if he had been in the habit of looking at it. He opened the case and put it in her hand. Miniatures have generally a monotonous resemblance to one another in their pink and white complexions and red lips and pencilled eyebrows. This one possessed no marked peculiarity to distinguish it from those already lying on Di's knee and on the window-seat. It was a lovely face enough, oval and pale and young, with dark hair and still darker eyes. It had a look of shy innocent dignity, which gave it a certain individuality and charm. The miniature was set in diamonds, and at the top the name Diana followed the oval in diamonds too. John and I looked long at it together. "'Do you think he cared for her very deeply?' said Di at last. "'I'm afraid he did. Always?' "'I think always. The miniature was in the drawer he used every day. I don't think he would have kept it there unless he had cared.' Di raised the lid of the case to close it, and as she did so a piece of yellow paper which had adhered to the faded satin lining of the lid became dislodged and fell back over the miniature on which it had evidently been originally laid. On the reverse side, now uppermost, was written in a large, firm hand the one word, FALSE. John started. "'I never noticed that paper before,' he said. "'It stuck to the lining of the lid,' he replied. "'It must have been always there.' The soft rain whispered at the lattice. In the silence one of the plants dropped a few faint petals on the polished floor. "'Then he never forgave her,' said Di at last, turning her full, deep glance upon her companion. He did not readily forgive. He must have been a hard man. I do not think he was hard at first. He became so. If he became so, he must have had it in him all the time. Trouble could not have brought it out, unless it had been in his nature to start with. Trouble only shows what spirit we are of. Even after she was dead, he did not forgive her. He put the miniature where he could look at it. He must have often looked at it. He left that bitter word always there. He might have taken it away when she died. He might have taken it away when he began to die himself. "'I am afraid,' said John, "'there were shadows on his life, even to the very end. "'The shadow of an unforgiving spirit.' "'Yes,' said John gently. "'But that is a deep one, Di. It numbs the heart. "'He took it down with him to the grave. If it is true that we can carry nothing away with us out of the world, I hope he left his bitterness of spirit behind. Di did not answer. The very unforgiveness and bitterness were in him only the seamy side of constancy, said John at last. He really loved your mother. If he had really loved her, he would have forgiven her. Not necessarily. A nobler nature would, but he had not a very noble nature. That is just the sad part of it." There was a long silence. At last Di closed the case and put it back in the drawer. She held the little slip of paper in her hand and looked up at John rather wistfully. He took it from her, and, walking down the gallery, dropped it into the wood fire burning at the further end. He came back and stood before her, and their grave eyes met. The growing intimacy between them seemed to have made a stride within the last half-hour, which left the conversation of yesterday miles behind. "'Thank you,' she said. End of Volume 2, Chapter 6「Volume 2, Chapter 7 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Volume 2, Chapter 7 Oh, the little more, and how much it is, and the little less, and what worlds away. Robert Browning Miss Fane, John's aunt, was one of those large, soft, fleecy persons who act as tea-cosies to the domestic affairs, 
and whom the perspicacity of the nobler sex rarely allows to remain unmarried. That by some inexplicable mischance she had so remained was, of course, a blessing to her orphaned nephew, which it would be hard to overrate. John was supposed to be fortunate indeed to have such an aunt. He'd been told so from a child. She'd certainly been kind to him in her way, and perhaps he owed her more than he was fully aware of, for it is difficult to feel an exalted degree of gratitude and affection towards a person whose journeys through life with a snort and a plush reticule, who is ever seeking to eat some new thing, and who sleeps heavily in the morning over a lapful of magenta crochet work. On religious topics also little real sympathy existed between the aunt and nephew. Miss Fame was one of those fortunate individuals who could derive spiritual benefit and consolation from the conviction that they belonged to a lost tribe, and that John Bull was originally the Bull of Bashan. Very wonderful are the dispensations of Providence respecting the various forms in which religion appeals to different intellects. Miss Fane derived the same peace of mind and support from her Bull, and what she called its promises, as Madeline did from the monster altar-candles which she had just introduced into the church at her new home, candles which were really gas-burners a pious fraud which it was to be hoped a deity so partial to wax-candles, especially in the daytime, would not detect. Miss Fane had an uneasy feeling, as years went by, that in spite of the floods of literature on the subject with which she kept him supplied, John appeared to make little real progress towards Anglo-Israelitism. Even the pamphlet which she had read aloud to him when he was ill, which proved beyond a doubt that the unicorn of Ezekiel was the prototype of the individual of that genus which now supports the royal arms. Even that pamphlet, all conclusive as if it was, appeared to have made no lasting impression on his mind. But, if the desire to proselytise was her weak point, good nature was her strong one. She was always ready, as on this occasion, to go to Overley or to John's house in London if her presence were required. If she stepped heavily amid his guests, it was only because it was her nature to. She slept more heavily than usual on this particular evening, for it was chilly, and the ladies had congregated in the music-room after dinner, where there was a fire, and a fire always reduced Miss Fane to a state of coma. Mrs. Courtney was bored almost to extinction, had been bored all day and all yesterday. But nevertheless her fine countenance expressed a courteous interest in the rheumatic pains and Jaeger underclothing of one of the elder ladies. She asked appropriate questions from time to time, bringing Miss Goodwin, who with her brother was dining at the castle, into the conversation whenever she could. Miss Goodwin, a gentle, placid woman of nine-and-twenty, clad in the violent colours betokening small means and the want of taste of richer relations, took but little part in the great Jaeger discussion. Her pale eyes under their white eyelashes followed Di rather wistfully as the latter rose and left the room to fetch Mrs. Courtney some wool. Between women of the same class, and even of the same age, there is sometimes an inequality as great as that between royalty and pauperism. Soon afterwards the men came in. Miss Fane regained a precarious consciousness. The painter dropped into a low chair by Mrs. Courtney, someone else into a seat by Mary Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin addressed himself indiscriminately to Miss Fane and the lady of the clandestine Jagers. John, after a glance round the room and a short sojourn on the hearth-rug, which proved too hot for him, seated himself on a strictly neutral settee away from the fire, and took up punch. Immediately afterwards, Di came back. She gave Mrs. Courtney her wool, and then, instead of returning to her former seat by the fire, gathered up her work, crossed the room, and sat down on the settee by John. The blood rushed to his face. Her quiet, unconcerned manner stung him to the quick. She spoke to him, but he did not answer. Indeed, he did not hear what she said. A moment before he had been wondering what excuse he could make for getting up and going to her. He been about to draw her attention to the cartoon in a two-days-old punch, for persons in John's state of mind lose sight of the realities of life, and in the presence of half a dozen people she could calmly make her way to him 
and seat herself beside him, exactly as she might have done if he had been her brother. He felt himself becoming paler and paler. An entirely new idea was forcing itself upon him like a growing physical pain, but there was not time to think of it now. He wondered whether there was any noticeable difference in his face, and whether his voice would betray him to die if he spoke. He need not have been afraid. Di did not know the meaning of a certain stolid look which John's countenance could occasionally take. She was perfectly unconscious of what was going on a couple of feet away from her, and picked up her stitches in a cheerful silence. Mary Goodwin saw that he was vexed, and, not being versed in the intricacies of love in its early stages, or indeed in any stages, wondered why his face fell when his beautiful cousin came to sit by him. "'Don't you sing?' he said, turning to Di. "'I whimper a little sometimes with the soft pedal down,' said Di, "'but not in public. There is a painful discrepancy between me and my voice. It is several sizes too small for me.' "'Do whisper a little all the same,' said the painter. "'John,' said Di, "'I am afraid you do not observe that I am being pressed to sing by two of your guests. Why don't you, in the language of the quiver, conduct me to the instrument?' The unreasoning, delighted pride with which John had until now listened to the smallest of Di's remarks, whether addressed to himself or others, had entirely left him. "'Do sing,' he said, without looking at her, and he rose to light the candles on the piano. And Di sang. John sat down by Mary, and actually allowed the painter to turn over. It was a very small voice, low and clear, which, while it disarmed criticism, made one feel tenderly towards the singer. John, with his hand over his eyes, watched Di intently. She seemed to have suddenly receded from him to a great and impassable distance, at the very moment when he thought they were drawing nearer to each other. He took new note of every line of form and feature. There was a growing tumult in his mind, a glimpse of breakers ahead. The atmosphere of peace and quietude of the familiar room, and the low voice singing in the listening silence, seemed to his newly awakened consciousness to veil some stern underlying reality, the features of which he could not see. Mary Goodwin, who had the music in her which those who possess a lesser degree of it are often able more fluently to express, left John, and going to the piano, began to, to turn over Di's music. Presently she set up an old leather manuscript book before Di, who, after a moment's hesitation, began to sing. O oh, broken heart of mine, death lays his lips to thine, his draught of deadly wine he proffereth to thee. But listen, low and near, in thy close shrouded ear, I whisper, dost thou hear? Arise, and work with me. The death waits on thine eyes, shut out God's patient skies. Cast off thy shroud and rise. What does thou mid the dead? Thine idle hands and cold, once more the plough must hold, must labour as of old. Come forth and earn thy bread. The voice ceased. The accompaniment echoed the stern sadness of the last words, and then was suddenly silent. What is it in a voice that so mightily stirs the fibre of emotion in us? It seemed to John that Di had taken his heart into the hollow of her slender hands. "'Thank you,' said Mary Goodwin, after a pause. And one of the elder ladies felt it was an opportune moment to express her preference for cheerful songs. Di had risen from the piano and was gathering up her music. Involuntarily, John crossed the room and came and stood beside her. He did not know he had done it so till he found himself at her side. Mary Goodwin turned to Miss Fane to say good-night. Di slowly put one piece of music on another, absently turning the right side upwards. He saw what was passing through her mind as clearly as if it had been reflected in a glass. He stood by her, watching her bend over the piano. He was unable to speak to her or help her. Presently she looked slowly up at him, 
he had no conception until he tried how difficult it was to meet without flinching the quiet friendship of her eye. John, she said, my mother wrote that song. Do you remember what a happy, innocent kind of look the miniature had? She was seventeen then, and she was only four and twenty when she died. I don't know how to express it, but somehow the miniature seems a very long way off from the song. I am afraid there must have been a good deal of travelling between whiles, and not over easy country. John would have answered something, but the good winds were saying good night, and shortly afterwards the others dispersed for the night. But John sat up late over the smoking-room fire, turning things over in his mind, and vainly endeavouring to nail shadows to the wall. It seemed to him as if, while straining towards a girl, he had suddenly discovered by the merest accident that he was walking in a circle. End of Volume 2, Chapter 7Volume Two, Chapter Eight of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Eight. Vous me quittez, n'ayant pu voir mon aim à travers mon silence. Victor Hugo. It was Saturday morning. The few guests had departed by an early train. The painter cast a backward glance at Overly and the two figures standing together in the sunshine on the grey-green steps, which, with their wide, hospitable balustrade, he had sketched so carefully. He was returning to the chastened joys of domestic life in London lodgings, to his pretty, young, jaded, fluffy wife and fluffy, delicate child, to the Irish stew and the warm drinking water and the blistered gravy of his home life. Sordid surroundings have the sad power of making some lives sordid too. It requires a rare nobility of character to rise permanently above the dirty tablecloth and ill-trimmed paraffin lamp of poor circumstances. Poverty demoralizes. A smell of cooking, and why I know not, but especially an aroma of boiled cabbage, can undermine the dignity of existence. A reminiscence of yesterday on the morning fork dims the ideals of youth. As he drove away between the double row of beeches, with a hand on his boarded pitcher, the poor painter reflected that John was a fortunate kind of person. The dog-cart was full of grapes and peaches and game. Perhaps the power to be generous is one of the most enviable attributes of riches. "'Poor fellow,' said John as he and I turned back into the cool gloom of the white stone hall. "'He has given Granny the sketch of me,' said Di. "'He's a nice man, but after the first few days he hardly spoke to me, which I consider a bad sign in any one. It shows a want of disturbment, don't you think so?' "'Alas, we are going away this afternoon. I wish, John, you would try and look a little more moved at the prospect of losing us.' It would be gratifying to think of you creeping on all fours under a sofa after our departure, dissolved in tears. John winced, but the reflections of the night before had led to certain conclusions, and he answered lightly, that is lightly for him, for he had not an airy manner at the best of times. I am afraid I could not rise to tears. Would a shriek from the battlement do? I should prefer tears, said Di, who was in a foolish mood this morning in which high spirits take the form of nonsense, looking at her cousin, whose sedate and rather impenetrable face stirred the latent mischief in her. Not idle tears, John, that I know not what they mean, you know, but large, solemn drops, full man's size, sixty to a teaspoonful. That's the measure by Granny's medicine glass. She looked very provoking as she stood poising herself on her slender feet on the lower edge of the hearthstone, with one hand holding the stone paw of the ragged old tempest lion carved on the chimney-piece. John looked at her with amused irritation, and wished, there is a practical form of repartee eminently satisfactory to the masculine mind which an absurd conventionality forbids. Wished, but what is the good of wishing? "'I must go and pack,' said Di, with a sigh, "'and see how Granny is getting on. She is generally down before this. You won't go and get lost, will you, and only turn up at luncheon?' "'I'll be about,' said John. "'If I'm not in the library, look for me under the drawing-room sofa.' 
Di laughed, and went lightly away across the grey and white stone flags. There was a lamentable discrepancy between his feelings and hers, which outraged John's sense of proportion. He went into the study, and sat down there, staring at the shells of embodied thought and speculation and aspiration, with which at one time he had been content to live, which, now that he had begun to live, seemed entirely beside the mark. Mrs. Courtenay was a person of courage and endurance, but even her powers had been sorely tried during the past week. She had been bored to the verge of distraction by the people of whom she had taken such a cordial leave the night before. There are persons who never, when out visiting, wish to retire to their rooms to rest, who never have letters to write, who never take up a book downstairs, who work for deep-sea fishermen, and are always ready for conversation. Such had been the departed. Miss Fane herself, for whom Mrs. Courtney pressed a certain friendship, was a person with whom she would have nothing in common, whom she would hardly have tolerated, if it had not been for her nephew. But for him she was willing to sacrifice herself even further. She had seen undemonstrative men in love before now. Their actions had the same bold significance for her as a string of molehills for a mole-catcher. She was certain he was seriously attracted, and she was determined to give him a fair field and as much favour as possible. That Di had not as yet the remotest suspicion of his intentions, she regarded as a little short of providential, considering the irritating and impracticable turn of that young lady's mind. Di entered her grandmother's room, and found that conspirator sitting up in bed, looking with rueful interest at a boiled egg and untouched rack of toast on a tray before her. Mrs. Courtney always breakfasted in bed, and could generally thank Providence for a very substantial meal. "'Take the tray away, Brown,' said Mrs. Courtney, with an effort. "'Why, you've not touched a single thing, ma'am,' remarked Brown reproachfully. "'I have drunk a little coffee,' said Mrs. Courtney faintly. "'Granny, aren't you well?' asked Di. Brown removed the tray, which Mrs. Courtney's eyes followed regretfully from the room. "'I am not very well, my love,' she replied, adjusting her spectacles, "'but not positively ill. I had a threatening of one of those tiresome spasms in the night. I dare say it will pass off in an hour or two. Di scrutinised her grandmother remorsefully. "'I never noticed you were feeling ill when I came in before breakfast,' she said. "'My dear, you are generally the first to observe how I am,' returned Mrs. Courtney hurriedly. "'I was feeling better just then, but um, we are due a calm yet today. It is very provoking.' Di looked perturbed. "'The others are gone,' she said. "'Even the painter has just driven off. "'Do you think we'll be able to travel by the afternoon, Granny?' "'I am afraid not,' said Mrs. Courtney, closing her eyes. "'But I think—I feel sure I could go to-morrow.' "'To-morrow is Sunday.' "'Oh, dear me, so it is,' said Mrs. Courtney, with mild surprise. "'Today is Saturday. It certainly is unfortunate. "'But after all,' she continued, it could not have happened at a better place. Miss Fane is a good-natured person, and will quite understand, and John is a relation. Perhaps you'd better tell Miss Fane I am feeling unwell, and ask her to come here, and, and that before you go, pull down the blinds halfway, and put that sheaf of her lost tribes and unicorns and stone ages on the bed. What induced John to spend the whole of Saturday afternoon, and the greater part of a valuable evening, at a small colliery town some twenty miles distant, it would be hard to say. The fact that some days ago he had arranged to go there after the departure of his guests did not account for it, for he had dismissed all thought of doing so directly he heard that Di and Mrs. Courtney were staying on. It was not important. The following Saturday would do equally well to inspect a reading-room he was building, and the new shaft of one of his mines, about the safety of which he was not satisfied. Yet, Somehow or other, when the afternoon came, John went. Up to the last moment after luncheon he had intended to remain. Nevertheless, he went. The actions of persons under a certain influence cannot be predicted or accounted for. They can only be chronicled. John did not return to Overley till after ten o'clock. He told himself most of the way home that Miss Fane and Di would be sure not to sit up later than ten. He made up his mind that he should only arrive after they had gone to bed. 
As he drove up through the Soviet darkness, he looked eagerly for Di's window. There was a light in it. He perceived it with a sudden resentment. She had gone to bed, then. He should not see her till tomorrow. John had a vague impression that he was glad he had been away all day, that he had somehow done rather a clever thing. But apparently he was not much exhilarated by the achievement. It lost somewhat in its complete success. And Mrs. Courtney, who heard the wheels of his dog-cart drive up just after Di had wished her good-night, said aloud in the darkness the one word, Idiot. End of Volume 2, Chapter 8